do conversations on social issues, a weekly event in the library that takes on different issues. Faculty, staff, students, community members are all welcome to talk about something that they care about. And this is a forum where if you have an issue and you want to put something on, you are welcome to come and talk to us and we'll get you set up. We're now planning for fall quarter. So come and see me. My name is Kelly McHenry. And I'm a librarian here. And um, we do this series because we want a place where people can express different ideas. And we see that this is part of the mission of the library, to have different kinds of information and different viewpoints. So I hope you, you will join us. Next week, there will be no COSI. So there's nothing happening here next week because the Unity Fair is going on. There is an event at 11 o'clock, is that correct? I think so, yeah. Yeah, what is that? Um, I don't remember. It's a, it's a, oh, it's a, I know it's, it's not part of COSI, but it's a literature event in this room at 11 o'clock. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know more about it. And then on June 2nd, Aaron Ness, Seattle Central student, will be talking about PrEP, the pre-exposure prophylaxis for people who do not have HIV but are at substantial risk of getting HIV. So he's going to be here talking about that on June 2nd. Well, today it's my pleasure to welcome Mahim Lakhani and Lev Sharma. They are um, from an organization called Underground Productions, and they produce three films. They're going to talk about the, um, one of their films today, Stuck in a Jam, Traffic City Growth and Inequality. So please give them a warm round of applause to welcome them. I'm Love Sharma, and I am a director of this one. I was just wondering, how many of you guys feel like traffic is a problem in Seattle? <laughs> 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 yeah, big problem. So, um, how long do you think it's been a problem? How recent is this big, small problem? Five years. Five years. I think off of like the last 10 years, it's kind of built up. Okay. 20. 20. Oh, we traffic we have out here at the south. This is a clip from 1970. Is there a, uh, audio? Is there more sound? So when we were doing research for the film, we found this clip from 1977. Uh, um, working at this college since 1988. Uh-huh, some of you weren't born probably. And, um, there was traffic, there always was a problem coming to work as far as that goes. We're standing up for an avenue overlooking what is being termed the Mercer mess. The city council is going to come up with those alternatives to getting around this bumper to bumper traffic. So, it's been, you know, we found out, been a problem for 40 years for sure, like from almost 40 years ago. Um, but as we look more into the history of the city, we um, found out that transit and traffic, uh, not really traffic that early, but transit has been a conversation for more than 100 years. Uh, the first time uh, subway plan, you know, mass transit like the light rail that we have, uh, was introduced or was proposed in Seattle was in 1912. And so we were looking at all of this history, but all of this started with the most present issue that we were facing about two years ago. Um, and I don't know how many of you guys will remember, but there was a proposition to fund transit prop one. Uh, and it was early in the year, I think April or May, and it failed. So what we were facing was the possibility of 16% bus cuts. Which is in 2014. 2014. So that means $500,000 of bus cuts. It's, it's one eighth of the service gone. And this is at a time when Amazon is expanding and you know lots of people are moving to the city. So 
there was a big problem and we began to talk with people about what they felt about it because you know this traffic conversation was coming up in every social gathering everybody was talking about it and wondering well next month when my bus is cut I don't know what I'm going to do so uh, so that's where we started talking with people and discovering what crop one was Looking down to Prop 1, earlier in 2014, that had a strong majority vote in Seattle but failed at the county level. But you know, one of the reasons these measures fail, and there's a logic behind it, is because they're always funded with the most regressive of taxes, which is the sales tax. And it's very rational on the part of working households, especially low income households, to reject that source of funding. Especially with the recession in 2008. Um, uh, sales tax revenues plunged, and sales tax is Metro's main source of funding. Um, and this is similarly with transit agencies around the country um, are sort of um, really heavily reliant on sales tax and other regressive taxes. So when sales tax revenues plunged, then suddenly Metro was facing this huge shortfall. Um, and between 2008 and 2011, they sort of did everything they could short of cutting service. So they raised fares four times, you know, they got a bunch of concessions out of drivers, they um, like tightened up the schedules, they made all these sort of, you know, laid off a lot of administrative staff, they dipped into the capital reserves, you know, and then when 2011 came around, they still had like a 50 or 60 million dollar annual deficit. So they started talking about cuts. So, to start off um, with, the drop one cuts were proposed in 2014 and in two, in two phases. The first one that came in was in September 2014, where they cut you know, some non-essential, what they call non-essential bus routes, but the bigger cuts were proposed for uh, February of uh, 2015. And there was a bigger program, you know, the, the King County based proposition failed, and Seattle was OV, the citywide you know, proposition, which passed with all of the majority of the city. So we, we started thinking about, oh, where does the funding come from? And I'd like to, you know, just open the conversation that if you guys have ideas, you know, that where should or where does project funding comes from? And, you know, what do you guys think about that? Do you guys know how our transit is funded? Uh, it's funded in part by a gasoline tax, but mostly by other taxes. That's true. So. Um, so Gas tax has an interesting limitation. Um, a significant chunk of it can only be poured back into roads and can't be used towards funding transit. And like only in creating new highways, like you know, a part of the gas tax cannot be used for you know expanding metro services. That's like a really weird statewide you know limitation, which really hampers transit in a lot of cities. Actually, what? Well, there are actually very few sources of taxes in, in Washington. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, most of our tax comes from sales tax, because there's no income tax, no income tax on, on people, and no income tax on corporations. So most of our funding comes from sales tax. Um, there used to be a car tax. There is a car tax tax, but there used to be a heavier one that was based on the value of the car, mm -hmm. rather than on just a, a flat fee. And when um, Tim Island had a proposition to cut that tax and make it a flat fee, the state lost millions and millions of dollars for yeah. those kinds of taxes. Um, that's true. And, and I think the, the initial proposition one was, you know, like that $60 straight car tax fee in county wide, which was, you know, just uh, a bit defeated with the older thing. So uh, the interesting thing about that was that it was defeated, it was a county-wide measure. It was all over King County, and it was defeated in King County. But when they looked at the individual regions and sub-regions votes, it passed overwhelmingly, or it was passing in theory, overwhelmingly in Seattle. Because Seattle overwhelmingly voted for transit um, to tax themselves. Um, so there's an interesting thing about, you know, Oh, Seattle is an urban space, more urban than probably any other city in Washington. So transit is more, you know, necessary and you know needed by people who live in the city. But when you look at statewide, you know, if you look at suburban and even like rural communities, they don't need that much, you know, transit as people in Seattle do. So 
there from you know from here there comes this weird dynamic between the state and the city. So the state might not want the city of Seattle to tax its citizens, you know, for a transit which people in the city need because by a statewide you know um, policy that that's something that they don't want to do. So we talked, we went to city hall, we you know just like uh, we sent out emails to people who were in city hall at that time. And we started asking them that, you know, hey, do you think this is a problem of city versus state? So if Columbia starts giving the city of Seattle more transit funding, would you think this problem can be solved? And keeping in mind that Washington has one of the most regressive taxes, you know, uh, system in the whole country. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no income tax. The millionaire tax was introduced, I think, a few years ago was, um, you know, defeated. And that was, I think, in county wise, but it still has a majority in the city of Seattle. But at that time, you know, Vulcan and Amazon they just poured like hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, in um, movements to oppose, you know, the millionaire tax, and you know, they succeeded. So yeah, the, the next part, you know, was just like going to city council and talking to the elected officials about, you know, what is this whole state of the world thing that's happening around this meeting. Well, here's the problem. All cities and all states are legally defined as creatures of the state. So we do not have much independent authority. There is a uh, ongoing discussion about a concept called preemption, which means that a state preempts the city's ability to pass certain laws. A good illustration is what happened about 20 years ago when um, the Republicans took control of both houses in the state legislature and the governorship. They only did it for two years, but when they took control, they immediately uh, banned rent control in Seattle. Up until that time, we could have rent control. And what they did was they preempted the city's ability to do much of the state's transportation funding comes from, uh, from gas taxes. Uh, from diesel taxes on diesel fuel and on uh, other fees charged on cars. Um, not all of it. I mean, obviously, there's like lots of different kinds of funding sources. Sales tax pays for some uh, for some transit. Uh, we have property taxes that pay for it for um, for local streets and roads. Uh, but the basic, you know, a big chunk of the money comes from the state gas tax, and that the, the for that the state keeps part of it and returns part of the, the gas tax to cities and counties. There's a small chunk of federal money that may be available for uh, from the state highway fund, which is now getting close to being uh, going bank, building a big new road. Well, I mean, the state, you know, here here's the, here's plenty of money. If you're just trying to get keep your buses running, you have to scramble for it. You, know, you have to sort of like look, you know, look, check in the couch cushions and look for money anywhere you can find it. If you are a, you know, in the business, if your entire business is built around uh, designing new roads, building big new projects, um, the only way you're going to get a cut of this big transportation package is if there's a significant amount of money for new projects, for new big mega projects. You know, a big new bridge across 520, or you want you know, widening lanes, uh, you want you know, a tunnel underneath the city of Seattle that's going to cost billions of dollars. That's just the place where you get big bucks, where the, well, a lot of the money goes to the engineering firms. In Washington transportation, we find ourselves in a hole. We, we, you know, we don't have enough money to pay for the things that we have already committed to. We don't have enough money to pay for uh, the mega projects that we have already planned to build. So when you're in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. So the person talking most in this clip was Clark William Berry. He is the he's a he's the founder and one of the people who work at the Cyclone Institute in Seattle. It's like a think tank, and you know, like they do really different kind of analysis and studies on on data, and you know, trying to find out what people want. So they actually did a study on you know Seattle, what the people of Seattle want in terms of funding from the state, like what should you know be allocated to to what, and what people wanted was majority, you know. They want most of the funding to go for maintaining roads. That was the number one concern of most of the citizens. The second one was, you know, creating and uh, having more alternative um, transit options, you know, like bike lanes or, you know, like adding new bus routes. And the third was, you know, having building new roads and building new highways. And 
what the state funding reflects is complete opposite of what people want. So this is like Bertha, which like you know is heavily funded by the state, which I don't think you know a lot of people actually wanted, you know, and there was like a whole you know public social engineering machine, you know, which like bamboozled the city into you know this um, funding for this new tunnel. So that was like a big disconnect in what people want and you know what the policies of of the city and the state actually look like. Do you want to add something about yeah. Oh, just one more thing. So this thing about so all the numbers quoted here are from 2014 and 2013. At that time, Bertha's uh, budget was on 1.4 billion dollars. So Sightline, you know, did some their own math on that, and you know, they, they said that for each inch that Bertha dug, a King County bus could run for four months. So for the actual, you know, 1.4 billion dollars, that amount of money can run the whole King County fleet for two years. That's like, you know, a lot of bus hours. Who were the champions of the town project at that time? It wasn't, you know, ordinary citizens. It wasn't um, the environmental community. We had leading politicians pushing for the town, championing the town. Who are they among them? It's the former, former governor, Christine Gregoire. It's the current mayor of Seattle, Ed Murray, was one of the most vocal champions of the town. Uh, the person we defeated in uh, the city council election, Richard Conlon, was one of them. It's not a coincidence that the town option became the only option, even though that was not the only option, and it was by far the worst option. The whole city was, you know, bamboozled into this tunnel option. And I think if you look at the policies that have been passed, transportation over you know decades what you see is exactly what corporations want they get what working people need is always pushed to the back burner it's always just an app so all of this introduction to bring us to the point where we began to talk to activists that were uh, you know talking about transit and increasing transit in Seattle people who were studying transit and traffic academics uh, politicians commuters, and we began to realize that this whole thing was a big, tangled mess. It was not just, you know, there was an instance of corruption that was unearthed, uh, no pun intended, but in Bertha was going on. There was an instance of corruption that the Seattle tunneling partners, people were using funds that the state had given to them to go uh, and play golf on company time. So, there was this corruption that was going on and why Bertha was you know, passed in the first place, we realized, we discovered that the option of a tunnel underneath the city of Seattle was put up to the voters several times and it failed the first few times. And finally the voters said, you know what, just, just do it. Um, the other options were pouring that much money to fund more transit along that corridor, just shutting the viaduct down. The reason all this is happening is because the viaduct is past its age and it could collapse in time. So we began discovering all of these things that were going on and then looking deeper into the issues, we found a lot of related issues with transit. And I was wondering, do you guys think any other issues are directly or indirectly related to transit? Uh, yeah, I think with rising rent in Seattle, there's a lot of economic refugees who have to move out to the suburbs but have to keep their jobs in the city. And so they have to travel a greater number of miles and that's increasing the number of cars on the road. Yeah, so that was one, definitely, like, housing is probably the most important, the most directly related thing that is, that is affected by transit. Well, I think they've built a train, a lot more buses that um, accommodate that, you know, transition of people coming from, like, Federal Way, Auburn, and Tacoma, you know, they, it makes it a lot easier for the past couple of years when they get to the city. Mm -hmm. They did an interesting thing there, though, that, uh, that train route, the light train, are you talking about the light yeah. train route? Um, that's great, but they, uh, what they did at that point when they got the light rail running, they took away the feeder buses. So since our, um, our light rail system is not, not so expanded that you can take the light rail from anywhere to anywhere. I mean, you guys are actually quite fortunate, it's just right next door. Uh, but I came from Northgate, until 2021 I can't actually take the light rail here after you know, drive a bus or bike. So, uh, there was this, you know, uh, there were feeder buses that were supposed to go in there. They took that money out and they put it into the South Lake Union trolley. And that is something that's, you know, it's barely used. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, 
Every time I, I used to live in East Lake, so it used, used to go just by my house. It was almost always empty. So that, that was, yeah, that was definitely one aspect. But I think now we are somewhat on the right track again. Somewhat on the right track with building more light rail and you know, there's, there's like this SD3 is coming out, but people are beginning to want transit. You know, the city is beginning to speak up a little bit more. Any other issues that you guys think? Well, you know, so one more thing, but what the light rail is also doing, they're buying the bus routes to force people to take the light rail so the convenient bus routes, you know, are getting taken away too, so it's kind of, they're good or they're bad. Yeah, yeah. Good. They're trying to find, yeah, I think. From North Seattle to, uh, which is actually traditionally very well served, and I would still say it's pretty well served. Uh, they took off four buses that came downtown, and now three of them, feed, one of them is cancelled, three of them feed directly into the light rail station. So there's all of this, you know, connected issues that are happening, but people are driving from, say, Edmonds or Everett, and uh, they, in order to prevent them from driving to downtown, where most of the employment is, you need to have some place there where they can drive and ride and park and ride or something like that, or feeder buses. But it, you know, the offset of that, like in the university district, you can't really park. They can't drive here and park. It's going to be worse for them. So, um, so this is something that you know, like you hit the nail on the head when you said that the rising costs are driving people out of the city. But at the same time, they have no other option but to drive into the city, and the taxes that are being you know the, ta the taxes that are being um, uh, that people have to pay are things like car tax fees and sales tax, which is something that everybody pays equally. So, somebody who's working a minimum wage job has to pay sixty dollar tax fee on their eighty now, I think, on their cars for a year, versus you know somebody like Bill Gates who has to also pay people for a car. So it's you know it's a, it's all of these related issues that are happening, but they are also looking into the history. There are more and more related issues that come up, and one thing that came up was the structure of the city. I don't know how much uh, how you guys feel about it, but it, it, in my experience, the city is still very segregated. That you know it, it is segregated by class, by you know by by financial status and by race, and so. We began looking at all of these issues that you know that was driving people out, and we came upon a bunch of related issues and some interesting histor historical tidbits about the city. When we were looking for somewhere to live here, I mean that was something I thought about, and so um, you know public transit in Seattle, for me, you know, where the ease of where it ran or how many bus lines ran out of it or if the light rail was near or if it was walkable, that all mattered in, in even deciding on the neighborhood to live in. I mean, as someone who would consider themselves middle class and um, who has a steady job, I mean, it was a struggle to find a place a, a place to rent in the city. You know, when you hire a, a software engineer and you pay him like a hundred and like 115, $125,000 a year, yeah, they can outbid anybody for the crappiest old 100-year-old house ever. We see this in San Francisco, we see this in New York, in other you know rapidly growing cities. It's not just the new construction that gets expensive, it's everything. I've been living in the hilltop house here the last maybe eight years. After my apartment in Ballard was sold, sold out from under me. <laughs> And I don't have a car anymore. Well, what I was living in was a duplex, and the people who owned it were tired of making the repairs that were necessary, and they wanted to sell it, and they did. And that became my my flat became a real estate office, and the real estate has been kind of booming in Ballard. Kind of difficult to make direct connections, but you can look at things like the real estate advertisements for the condos that are being built in Capitol Hill and find the connection to exactly who they're marketing to. And I actually had a student who did a research project where she found like an internal document from some of the developers uh, at a project in Capitol Hill and they explicitly talked about how their market was, the people who were moving to South Lake Union. And so you can imagine the sort of ripple effect where 
folks move into those complexes to work in South Lake Union, the property values and rents get driven up in Capitol Hill, the folks who used to live there get priced out further afield. Uh, so there's this kind of regional dynamic where the you know, development of a space like South Lake Union, though people would say it didn't displace a lot of people directly because there wasn't a ton of housing there, is actually producing ripple displacement in other places. So gentrification is tangentially related to transit, not directly. And I think one could make the argument that when more transit, you know, comes to a neighborhood, it automatically like you know raises the raises the the, the rent values, which you know in a ripple effect, you know, like increased gentrification of that area. So, and gentrification, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it involves race, you know, as one of the, um, of the, you know, along with class, you know, a major component of it. So, in a way, you know, like transit is also related to racism happening, you know, in a city at, at some time. And I think uh, gentrification is like a new old form of segregation which used to happen, you know, back in the day in Seattle. And while making this documentary and talking to people, you know, we also discovered that, just like I said not some time ago, that Seattle has a really um, bad yeah. racist past. Um, past. Um, North Seattle was considered a sundown area, so people of color were not allowed to be there after sunset. And a lot of the properties have deeds in them. Uh, the property deeds say that this cannot be uh, rented out to or uh, sold to um, African Americans, to uh, Jews, to Muslims, to Hindus, to uh, anybody but the Caucasian face. In fact, up until 1950, they found a document, in, I think in 1948. 1948, no, 1948, so up until 1948, these deeds were being written. This is after you know World War II when you know, Nazism had a part of being feared. But up until the 1980s, it was still discovered in the language. It was not outlawed, I think, until the 1980s. Language like this, where uh, they found one deed that said, this cannot be rented out or sold to anybody who was not of the Aryan race. So there is this history that dictates what happens now you know, in the city. It's heavily segregated. North Seattle is primarily white, and South Seattle is, you know, is, is actually that it's more diverse in Central and South, but now as the light rail is coming, all of those areas are now beginning to become desirable neighborhoods. So they're building these condos, they're buying out people, you know, and there's, of course, tied into that mark, uh, the housing market crash. People can't, you know, pay their mortgage anymore. So they're buying them out and building these big condos that is being sold to a very specific class of people. But that class also dictates in some way what race is, is being catered to. So, you know, people who are making big money in Amazon or Microsoft or some of those big other, um, you know, companies are the sort of ones who are able to afford that. So there's this interesting issue where segregation has almost just been renamed. You know, it's gentrification is the new segregation. And it's something that is not spoken about. When you talk about transit, it's not, you know, we don't talk about the this is because of race, but there is a, a very key racial component to it. And so this is something that we found academics talking about, but the common person, you know, put the question to them like that, and they're like, no, this has nothing to do with that. You know, I'm, I'm white, I take the bus, something like that. So it was, it was this interesting sort of, you know, unwrapping that was happening when we were, as we were making the film. And we were discovering a lot about the history and the current situation of Seattle that we had no idea about. So, well, I just I want to add to one more point. So, a lot of us, you know, can take the bus if we want to. We can drive as well, you know, like if, so, if, if you have a car, you know, transit is not something that you really need in your life. And it might be good to have in your neighborhood, but it's fine, you know, you can drive again. Okay. But when, if that's the only way that you have to get around, you know, if you are not able bodied, if you don't have a car, or if you, and if you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have good, you know, public transit, then you know you are just immobile, you know. And uh, the Transit Riders Union, one of the organizations that we talk to, they talk about mobility and transit as a human right. So 
once you know bus service is a cut, it, it, it's also like worthwhile to look into who is affected by that the most. You know, it's definitely people who come from a less privileged background and who happen to be a lot of times people of color, you know, who are affected more by traffic cuts as compared to, you know, the people who have money and you know who can afford to live in a neighborhood you know, which has seen the life. is associated in middle class and upper class people oh, yeah. with the poor, and that there is um, an unwillingness to dedicate money, more money to things that people think of almost as social services, rather than as things that serve an entire kind of service. Usually what you're doing, not always, but usually what you're doing is disproportionately affecting transit-dependent populations, and those tend to be people who for some reason either can't drive or can't afford to drive. If you're in an urban area, and we're in, a, in a, you know, some of the, the outlying suburbs, uh, and particularly if you're a, a person with a limited income, transit service is not just an, like a convenient way of getting around or another choice. It can sometimes be your lifeblood. It's the only option, reliable option you've got. All the way public transit affected folks who, um, homeless youth, right? And so, or young adults, homeless young adults. And, um, you know, public transit for them, you know, they couldn't, if it wasn't running regularly or if a line was cut or prices went up, that directly affected them getting to office for meetings, um, you know, with their caseworkers, or it directly affected them trying to get to a job. There's always the one or two transit dependent people, you know, the woman that can't walk anymore or the someone who's visually impaired. And I've had more often than not, uh, a bus will pull away and it was my mom. When public transit is really poor, it means you just can't get where you need to go. And so you stay home, or you walk, or if you're you know, disabled or old, you don't go. Um, and so you know, that's happened with, like, with the September service cuts. Like, um, you know, there's some um, areas that during certain times of day or on the weekends, they just lost their bus service. Um, so that's a really serious impairment of mobility. Um, but on a more on a lower level, it's just as someone who relies on public transit um, with a bus system that's not great, you just end up spending a lot of your time and much more of your income than you should be getting around. So you're sitting there in the morning and you need to get across town for your appointment and you gotta check the schedules and they don't line up and you're gonna have to wait for half an hour here and then you know the bus is too crowded and it passes you by so you gotta wait another 45 minutes or you, know, you end up spending like four or five hours of your day um, just getting around. Um, and that really impairs your quality of life, it impairs your ability to, to improve your life really. is a highly segregated space. Proportionately, we don't have a huge African-American population, but the historical population that was here was limited to specific areas adjacent to the sort of railway corridor, which would have been the industrial land when the city was developed near sort of Capitol Hill uh, and actually, yeah, Central District. Um, North Seattle was a sunset area, so not only were people of color not allowed to live north of the ship canal, but they were not allowed to be there at all after sunset. So there's this sort of intense history of segregation, and now the way that gentrification is working is it's sort of uh, that corridor that we just talked about in the south is where a lot of those historically African American communities have been and are now getting priced out. So So, uh, how many of you guys own cars? Have you guys, um, like, I don't know if you're familiar with other cities in the country, but uh, it seems like, you know, in this country, it is a, there's some association with cars, the fascination with cars and personal liberty that, you know, somewhat does not exist in other countries as much. Um, you know, if you travel to European countries, there are 
very well served by transit. And I don't, don't just mean the rich Western European countries, but even the uh, countries that are part of Soviet Russia and uh, Eastern European countries, if you go to any of the major cities, they have great public transit systems built around the 1900s on the same time that we were considering it. Um, but then there's this, you know, there's this interesting thing that ties it to this country, and that was something that we asked people about, and we, you know, it, there was no clear answer for it, but it seemed like here in America we really love our cars, you know. Every time transit is proposed, there's a section, Tim Anwin, you know, is one of them, I think, and then there's other people on the east side, there's a group um, who built the, the uh, I-90. Um, they are always just talking about there's a war on cars. So, I don't know if you guys have heard this term, but there's always a war on cars, you know, every time you guys start, every time there's like, I remember when this bike lane was being put in um, with the, with the uh, trolley line, there was this huge human cry, nobody uses this, why are you guys creating this, this is one lane less for us. And actually, I don't think the lane has been removed, but it's always just, you know, this war on cars. So we, I just have one more thing to add to it. I think with America and, I'm not from there, so you know, this is just, you know, what I've read and, you know, thought about, but I could be wrong, that cars have become um, fabric of a societal myth that has been propagated, you know, when the country was being developed and, you know, when the sort of expansion was happening. So in a way, you know, it's associated with, you know, macho, you know, being macho, you know, having power, that's why, you know, there's this big, you know, thing about, oh, you know, my car is, you know, it can, you know, it, it's, it's, it has this many horsepower, you know, it can, you know, it makes this a sort of loud, you know, a loud sound, which is very desirable. So it's almost, you know, like it's, it's a fabric of, you know, the myth which the country made for itself, you know, when it was developing. And I think that makes it a really strong metaphor for the whole society to, you know, follow it. Like my said, like it's almost a rite of passage. You you get out of college and you get your first car. You know, in all of those celebrity questionnaires, it says, when did you get your first car? What was your first car? You know, that's not like when you got your first transit pass. Oh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I feel like it's uh, kind of a cultural difference between like a capitalist country and a not capitalist country, where the idea is really pushed that like we need to have everything to ourselves, everything needs to be individual, like and it's a cultural norm in order to make us buy more. So it's like, you need your own car, you need your own house, you need your own this, where in a lot of countries, it's more like publicly funded, shared living, shared transportation, shared services, shared everything, right? So it's just kind of like a product of everything being privatized. That's actually right, the next section. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, 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 no. That was exactly what this, you know, what we discovered. Yeah. Just like a little more on that, but I think you're right, and you know, when Henry Ford was making the cars, you know, in the early 19th, uh, 20th century, you know, like his cars were not as good as compared to what was coming, you know, which were like, some of them were like electric cars coming. And the way, you know, that he was able to sell all these cars was that, oh, you know, with these rugged, you know, men, you know, like covered in grease, you know, like driving these really loud cars that, you know, would go really fast, but, you know, in the long run would fail, you know, like they would like, they would be out of service in a, in a, in a few years, and you know, like that's that's what I'm thinking of. You know, that. Yeah, and it complex this you know industrial, military, industrial, capitalist complex had this new tool to them, this marketing tool, the television and advertisements. So, thanks so much. Uh, our love of cars is about culture, right? Culture, cars are sexy, cars are great, cars are freedom, cars show your wealth and how great you are. Libertarian um, ideals here. It's so interesting how we get really um, nervous about anything we think of as social engineering, anything we think of encouraging people not to drive is bad. But what we never really address is the amount of social engineering that, we, that it required to get us to this place, right? Where you're required to, you know, be between the ages of 16 and whatever age before they tell you you can't drive anymore, where you're required to be able-bodied, where you're required to have enough money to afford a car and to want to you know, overcome the fear because it's scary you know, to drive. That's okay, right? It's okay to dedicate tons of public space to cars. It's okay to you know, charge everybody who doesn't drive for the infrastructure for cars. It's okay to pass on all these externalities and health issues and environmental problems but it's not okay, you know, to encourage people not to drive. It's not okay to take away one parking space or take away one lane. 
Um, and that is so ingrained in people because that's the way they grew up, thinking getting around is the same as driving a car, and that means that's freedom, right? That's my right. That's my right. I paid for this car. I paid all this money. I should be able to drive it. So yeah, so I'm, um, after all of this, discovering all of these problems and just sort of feeling helpless because one person does not affect change, we began to look at what are people doing to you know, make this change, to change, um, change the way that we think about cars, change the fact that we don't have enough transit to go from one place to the other. And we came upon all of these small groups. So change, progressive change never comes from above. You know, people that sign in the laws are seldom the people who build the movement to make it happen. You know, the fifteen dollar minimum wage law that was put in place did not actually come from Edward Murray, even though he signed it into action. It was coming from you know movements that. In fact, I remember in the early days of the movement, we were filming uh, Shama Samantha's teacher. There was right outside Seattle Central. There was a rally held. That was when it was. It was a distant thing in the horizon. People were calling them crazy about talking about fifteen dollars minimum wage. But that was what we discovered that it was people who were working two shifts minimum wage were out there, you know, take on a weekend on a Saturday morning, sunny Saturday morning, you know how precious that is in Seattle. They were out there just sort of trying to affect change. And then we discovered the you know the way that transit changes have been coming in into the city have actually been through some of these movements. You know, for instance, as election time comes forward, uh, you know, you have the transit union, you've got the uh, writers' transit union as well, so you have the union and the writers' club. Um, if they were to have local chapters or show up in the districts, Democratic district organizations, and push for uh, and all these organizations to interviews to include questions about transit, supporting transit through additional revenue sources, that helps. And that way you're building momentum. Quite honestly, that involves a lot of work, a lot of uh, research, and a lot of organizing. And it's also incremental change, which makes it very frustrating for a lot of folks. So what I found is that you can make, uh, I would say, long-term sustainable progressive changes. But what you do need is it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of patience. But the cumulative effect is that you do get changes. I mean, for instance, in Seattle, We've got you know wage death laws passed and paid sick and lead passed and transits in the minimum wage. Um, they may look like they occurred all of a sudden, but there's a lot of really grassroots activity learned to that one before. If you're not functioning to change the system, then basically you're supporting the system. And you have to have uh, a popular uh, community-based organizations out there, no matter what they are, and they have to be strong, and they have to keep pounding on government to do something. Yeah, so let's see how to go here today. Marijuana and decriminalization, the upholding of gay marriage, why did that happen? That did not happen because the uh, top people in the Democratic and Republican Party were fighting night and day for it. No, that happened because of uh, activists on the ground. In fact, the whole history of gay rights is uh, a monumental testament to grassroots activism, to you know, people on the ground, LGBT, ordinary LGBT people saying, enough, I, I, I refuse to live in such an oppressive This is a rat, and we have to figure out how to do a kind of organizing that is not, it's not like unprecedented or something, but it's different. It's really like we have to figure out how do we organize today. And um, you know, just the conditions of life and work today are so different from um, you know, you look at past um, social and economic movements in this country, like in the 60s or in the 30s, like the union movement in the 30s, and it was just a totally different landscape in a lot of ways. And today, um, just, just the conditions of work, it's like we can't, you know, we're this sort of precarious workforce where even people who make a lot of money, you know, they could get laid off tomorrow and then have nothing. Um, and then there's so many people who are just working part-time, just going from job to job, you know, working um, tough jobs, and it's just, it's a lot harder to organize in this traditional industrial union model with a globalized economy. Um, and so, um, you know, really we need to figure out how do we organize people in this, in this stable way when, when our lives are so unstable. So, uh, actually in the interest of time, I was just 
but I, I wanted to open the floor to you guys and see if you guys have any questions about the film, about the film, about the content, about the process of making it. And about you know, what your favorite mode of uh, organizing or standing up to the system is. It, you know, it doesn't have to be joining a union or like, I think expressing solidarity with the current organizations that stand up to power is important. But at the same time, I think uh, it could be stifling for people to feel that, oh, we have to do one of these five things. So it's very important to you know figure out what your way of expressing dissent is going to look like. How did you guys get interested in this subject? And um, you know, did, did, what was your background when you came to be making a film? Did you have any experience? No, actually, we had no experience whatsoever with filmmaking. We were helping a f friend who, uh, who is a filmmaker. And we had planned, after the crop planting, we were just looking for a topic, and we came up with this topic that was you know, controversial. And we decided to make a seven or eight minute film. But as we started talking to people, it became such an interesting thing that we began to teach ourselves filmmaking. We're actually now retroactively going to if you look at this whole film, it's very amateur. We're taking classes at Northwest Film Forum, and you know, we're teaching ourselves the yeah. But it was, it was just, you know, happenstance, largely, uh, largely being in the city where transit was becoming a problem for each person. So there's some personal aspect of it that was involved. And also, I think um, it was around the same time that I had moved to Seattle. So it was a very um, special time, you know, in my life to be close to my friends and in the same city because before that. I have been friends with her for the last almost 15 years now and after we finished our uh, undergrad, this was after 2013 was the only time that we were living in the same city together. So I think it was just the thing about spending time with your friends that and needing a creative outlet, you know, which both of us felt at that time that just, you know, made us help our friends was making it a short term. But also what Naim said earlier, I think that played a part which it was subconscious, but we were we were participating in all of these movements. We were going out to marches and marching with the free metal crowd, with, you know, all of these various um, groups. But we were still feeling a little bit helpless. You know, what, when you are just a drop in the ocean, it's hard to feel empowered. Empowered. It's hard to feel like you are affecting any change. And this was when you know the fifteen dollar thing also hadn't been passed. So. So yeah, this this was one of those things where we made this piece of work, you know, however bad it is, however amateur and beginner stuff it looks like, it's still something that we did to put our views forward or what we thought was right, to just sort of do the right thing. So that I think that played a significant part. That was a big motivator because this became a year long project and we were, you know, in the beginning, not able to get appointments with city council members, and we just sort of almost camped outside the office, but even that was not happening. So then we found people that we knew at the march, who knew people in her office, who knew her secretary, who gave us an interview. So it became this thing where to get the publicly elected officials to answer questions, to be answerable, responsible, it was such a hard process. So it was, you know, it was this kind of thing which was kind of, it was, Discouraging, but also motivating at the same time. I think being in a team helps where if one person is discouraged at one point, the other is discouraged. So, yeah, and then we decide, okay, this is a topic that deserves the whole. And also, we didn't have a story in mind when we started, you know, even when we thought that, oh, this is going to take more than eight or ten minutes, we didn't have anything in mind, you know, but we knew that this was a complex topic. And in a way, the more we talk to people, the more we talk to activists, the more we just talk between ourselves and read articles and stuff. It was like, you know, the, the whole ecosystem of problems, they just revealed themselves to us. And, you know, it was a process, you know, where the story formed, you know, as we filmed, you know, along. So, which was frustrating, you know, a lot of times, but, you know, it was also very satisfying to, you know, feel you were coming from one point to the other, going through this whole long journey and making something meaningful out of it. So it is a eight minute long? No, it's actually one hour 43 minutes long. Yeah. It's very hard to get people to watch it. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. get pizza, yeah. you get beer. <laughs> so have you screened it um, publicly? Yeah, uh, we screened it at Northwest Film Forum. Um, and it was just like a victory lap, you know, where it was just like a friend, you know, all our friends and family had come because 
all our relationships happen in the course of meetings and still members so long. Yeah. yeah. You know, people are starting to go, so I'm just going to pass out the um, our surveys that we have. Just play this one last time. We asked some people how you feel when you're stuck in a traffic jam and you have one of these interesting responses. And if you're not feeling to be alone in such close proximity to other people who I can't communicate with or make contact with, so there's a sense of isolation to it, uh, by which I just mean I don't get a good sense of who the other people are around me. I don't get a good sense of what this city is about. I'm relatively new here, so I'm always interested to just even have micro interactions with other people just to get a sense for who lives, in, who lives with me in this space. And I feel it's very difficult to get that in a car. Is that from Godard's Weekend? Push and shut. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever done that. Uh, I saw this happening once where there was a big traffic jam on I-5 South and people were stopped. I think it was when uh, President Obama was visiting. And then people had somebody had a ball in their car and they stood outside and it. But it's a fun activity you can try. Actually, don't. Yeah, be safe. So you talked about grassroots organizing. Um, I think so. Personally, I feel like voting is you know it's important. You have to exercise your mentality, right? But it tends to instill this feeling that you do this one thing every four years and things will be okay. I think when it was proposed, it was you know it was it was a leap from having you know a feudal system where people rule you and have to win over your body. Do this thing where everybody had this agency uh, to elect their officials and through them elect their opinions. But you know, I don't think that it's it's that effective in when it happens every once in two years. And so I think it's important to participate to enforce that pressure. I wish that wasn't the case. But it got Kashama elected. Yes. Right? Yes. And, um, I think that people tend to focus on the big elections rather than the local elections that affect them the most. And we're hoping that at this college we can we want people to become aware that they do have a voice that and that's one of them. Actually the transit riders you mean is a very small group, I think twenty five to fifty people. And they through their constant like um, you know, harassing almost the, the city council, they got this city law passed low income uh, for low income wages. They have a special uh, price, transit price. They got it passed. This, this is the first of its kind in the country. It happens in other countries, but in this country, this was the first a handful of people, 25 to 50 people. And so that, you know, it's tough and it seems discouraging, but there, like there you have that example where if you're willing to go out there and question your representatives and put, put a, give them a plan which actually works, sometimes, you know, sometimes you can force that change to happen. I think like one of the biggest threats to the form right now is global warming. And you know, as you know, cars are the number one contributors to carbon emissions and stuff like that. I mean where um I still feel like it's a very taboo subject because people don't want to admit it. Um when you were talking to the city councils and people, did they address global warming? Did they because if we had more public transportation, it would be a lot more convenient for people than people with the car as much, so it's like yeah, uh, we did, and actually um, we had to cut this presentation out, but there was an important uh, you know, section of this which was talking about global warming. So Shama's, um, uh, Shama's party had a candidate against uh, the legislative uh, uh, elect elected official from, from Seattle area, uh, Frank Chow. Frank Chow, uh, so Jess Fear from the Socialist Alternative was fighting against Frank Chow, and her primary focus was uh, global warming, because she's a climate scientist. So it was an important thing that a lot of people were talking about. And you're right, I mean, it is a win-win. And a lot of countries and places are realizing it. But I think um, it's a process that takes a lot of time. You know, like building light trail will definitely affect that change and bring down emissions. And, um, so, yeah. Um, just to like add on to that, I think that there have been 
some studies done that say that, you know, even like running empty buses, that contributes to global warming as well. So I, I think like there is still like room for improvement when it comes to what sort of transit you can use depending on the time of the day and you know how many people are using it. But at any you know, in any case it's much better you know, than everyone who's driving and they you know they want to move in, in Seattle, in a dense area, um, a bus removes 60 cars on average. Um, like 60? Yeah, 60, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because uh, um, I think the average number of people in a car, I'm not sure about Seattle, but I think in America it's like 1.1, 1.1 or 1.2. It's almost like one person. Yeah. And if you look at one of those where, yeah, 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 those uh, articulated buses, which you know, the metro has, you know, pretty long ones, they have more than 60 you know, people in a during rush hour traffic. Yeah. I would say even like 90 sometimes. Oh, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Were the solutions to this problem you guys foresee by doing all this research, you guys seeing like outcomes to like start, you know, besides I'm voting, I know voting helps to get certain things have, but what do you guys see as solutions? So one thing that's coming up is the ST3. One of the immediate things is ST3, some transit 3. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but so light rail has been funded for some tracks. It's funded till um, North Gate in 2021 and then 2023 in Linwood. This track, one single north to south lane, has been funded. And then the track has been funded from uh, the International District via I 90 to Redmond. Other than that, there are five new pro uh, proposed tracks uh, for which some transit 3 is going to have a vote in. November to approve that plan. And that plan is to connect West Seattle, um, uh, Everett, um, Bellevue, um, and a couple other places. And it's a pretty expansive plan. I think it goes on to 2043 or 2038. And, uh, but at the end, it looks like a very well connected network. You know, you could possibly go from any place to any place in the city with one change, uh, one transfer, and uh, if it's rapid transit, probably in you know, less than 40 minutes or something. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's coming up, and there are many uh, organizations that are spreading awareness so you vote for it, because there are also organizations spreading uh, you know, the idea that no, this is too much money, because it has to come from something, so it's, it's going to be tax. But you have to be registered to vote. Yeah. Exactly. So anybody who's not registered to vote, you have it until I think October 10th mm -hmm. to register to vote. You want to be in the primaries, you need to do it by July. Yeah. What's that? Turn these into you. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you.